Well, good morning. It is good to see everybody here as well as uh, have you all on Facebook or YouTube join us uh, for our worship here, October 11th, 2020, as we get ready to worship the Lord this morning. Uh, we'll uh, just do that because that's what we're here for. Uh, we came in here to worship the Lord, and I pray that all of us will be able to just clear our thoughts and our minds and, and worship from the heart this morning. Uh, the altar flowers are presented by Donna Heishman in honor of all her children to the glory of God. Uh, another announcement, uh, Jay Shadow passed away on September 28th at the Thornwald Nursing Home. And uh, we're sad to hear of his passing and know that Jay's in heaven now with his Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, Jay's wishes were, uh, according to the home, were to not have a service and uh, also not have an obituary. So that's probably why you did not see anything uh, in the paper or, or anything like that. Uh, we have some upcoming events. One of those is Trunk or Treat. And so uh, we would really encourage you to come out for that. We're going to space out really far in the parking lot because we're going to have to walk a lot this year in our parking lot. But we'd like you to come out for that on October 29th. That's a Thursday from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock. And uh, please uh, bring your things as a grab and go. So if you have little tiny candies, uh, if you can put them in a Ziploc, little Ziploc lunch bag or something like that, so the kids can just grab that. Uh, try and make it as grab and go as possible. If you're, you're like giving out the big old candy bars, which are nice, uh, <laughs> Uh, you don't have to do those. You'll be able to separate those like out. If you can bring a little portable table in uh, for the kids just to grab it off of, that'd be even better. So uh, please consider joining us uh, for that this year. Uh, there's also an announcement. Uh, I can't announce this because we're on Facebook. So I'll announce that one another, another uh, Sunday here. Now I won't. I'm going to have to turn off Facebook. Forgot this one. Sorry. All right. If you start it when it's on its side, it tells you to rotate it so that it'll be, it's, it's a mess. So sorry about that, those of you who are watching us on Facebook. Uh, we hope that you're back with us at this time. Uh, with that, let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship this morning. <laughs>
Thank you, Mike. Those who are able, please stand and join me in our responsive call to worship. Our responsive call to worship is found in Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that we can come together here, gather together, as your word calls us to do. And we can praise you, Lord. We praise you this morning. We praise you in music. We praise you in song. We praise you in the reading of your word. Lord, may our hearts be filled with joy as we come into your presence here. To worship you. God, we do ask that you would be here. Fill this place with your presence, Lord. May we be able to be together here with you, listening with our ears, opening our hearts and our minds to you, God. We thank you for the privilege that we have to pray. We have the privilege of singing in worship as well. And God, we ask that you would just be here with us now as we have come to praise you. Praise the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father. standing as we sing two hymns. Uh, we have come into his house and come Christians join to sing.
Thank you. You may be seated. As we go into our time of prayer, I remind you to pray for those that are in your bulletin and take them home and please pray for them as well uh, during the week. And uh, we'll go to our Lord at this time in prayer. Almighty God, you deserve our praise. Above anything and all, Lord, you are magnificent, wonderful, and Lord, you are you, you deserve the praise, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that's why we're here this morning, to lift up your name. We're in wonder, Lord, in awe of your greatness. And we thank you that we're able to come together. Lord, I pray for many throughout the world who are not able to do what we are doing here this morning. I pray for those uh, in states in the United States that uh, have not come back together, Lord, and I pray for those pastors and those congregations that they would be obedient to your your word, Lord, and that they would come together and meet uh, fellowship with one another, God. We are right to obey God rather than men. God, we thank you for this opportunity once again this morning, God, where we're able to just sing from our hearts of how great you are. And we'll do that here at the end of the service as well. And I look forward to that too. God, we thank you for just the ways that you have worked in our lives. It's a weird, weird year that we're in, Lord, but if we open our eyes and are obedient to you, we will be able to see the wonderful things that you have done. God, it looks like chaos in many parts of the world, even here in our own country. But you are in control. Remind us of that, Lord. Speak to us of this in our own devotionals, in the the messages that we hear. May we hear that you are in control, God. May we have faith, faith over fear, Lord, in our lives. God, we thank you for uh, caring about us, loving us, And God, I pray for those that we mentioned here this morning who have many different health problems across the board. We pray, Lord, that you would be with them, bring healing, bring comfort, give them peace, we pray, Lord. And through times like these where challenges, troubles come into our lives, Lord, may we use those to be ever drawn closer to you. I pray those that are struggling through different sicknesses right now, that they would just feel your presence close to them. May they be drawn close to you as well. Pray for families who are coming alongside them as well. We pray for strength for the individual that's sick, but also for the families that are taking care of loved ones. God, We we lift them all up to you at this time, and we place them into your care, your loving, tender hands, Lord. We pray that you would touch them at this time. God, for our service here this morning, we ask that you continue with us. Be with us. May, May our hearts be inclined to you. God, for the offering that has been taken this morning, we thank you. We ask your blessing upon it as well. We ask, Lord, that it would be used according to your will and not our own. Thank you for those who gave this morning and bless them as well. God, we ask all of these things in the precious name of our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We're going to get started with our message this morning. Uh, We're back in our series uh, called Naked in the Bible, and, and we've looked at two different passages so far. Uh, we've looked, the first one was Adam and Eve naked in the garden, and we looked at uh, what their innocence looked like before uh, they sinned, and then how that innocence was taken away from them after they ate that prohibited fruit uh, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And uh, then we took a look at Noah's nakedness, and we looked at alcohol abuse, and we talked about that dangers of that as well as the problems it causes for the individual, as well as families. 
And uh, we, we saw how that led to family problems for Noah and ultimately him cursing his grandson Canaan uh, there. Today we're going to be looking at a passage that involves King David and I titled the message, Disrobing as Any Vulgar Fellow Would? Question mark. And so uh, we're going to look at the scripture here in a little bit. Uh, a lot of times when you hear this story, at least since I was a kid, I've heard these rumors, sort of, uh, that, that you hear that he danced naked. David danced naked before the Lord as they brought the Ark of the Covenant into the city of David. And a question we pose this morning is, did he? Did he actually do that? Uh, there's a few backstories to the scripture today. We're going to look at those as, as well to give us a little bit of place of, of what's happening here. The story uh, does take place, as I said, where David's getting ready to have the Ark of the Covenant moved into uh, Jerusalem, into the city of David. Uh, today we're going to answer the questions. As I said, did David dance uh, naked? What is an ephod or an ephod? Uh, why would David dance before the Lord? Why was his wife, Michael, so upset with him? What are the consequences for her? How in the world does this apply to us today? As many of you are probably wondering uh, about this passage. Uh, we'll look at obedience to God's word this morning, as well as how we present ourselves before the Lord in worship. And I'll give you a hint that has to do with our hearts. So please follow along up here on the screen or in your Bibles as we read uh, 2 Samuel 6, verses 1 to 23. This is the word of the Lord. David again brought together out of Israel chosen men, 30,000 in all. He and all his men set out from Bala of Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty who is enthroned between the cherubim that are on the ark. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it. And Ahio was walking in front of it. David and the whole house of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with songs and with harps, lyres, tambourines, sistrums, and cymbals. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, the place is called Perez Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months. And the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Now King David was told, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went down and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fat, fattened calf. David, wearing a linen ephod, danced before the Lord with all his might, while he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites. Both men and women and all the people went to their homes. When David returned home to bless his household, Michael, daughter of Saul, came out 
to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. And Michael, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your word to us this morning. We thank you, Lord, that we are able to learn from people's lives uh, way in the past, Lord, and put that into perspective for our lives today. God, we ask that you would just be with us now. May we hear from you, Lord. Forgive me of my sins, I pray, Lord. Speak through your servant, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So... As you see in the passage that we just read, David is preparing to move the ark into the city of David, into Jerusalem. It might be good to quickly go over uh, how the ark ended up where it is as David gets ready to move it. Because that's a whole other story of how it ended up inside of this guy's house of Benadab. Uh, way back in 1 Samuel chapter 7 we find that the ark had returned from the land of the Philistines. I preached a message on this. It's been probably over a year now, but uh, it, it came back from the Philistines. They had conquered the Israelites and carried off the ark of the Lord into their territory. Ended up being a whole mess for them as plagues followed it wherever it went in the cities in the land of the Philistines. So they wanted rid of the thing. And so they put it on a new cart and they hooked up two cows that had calved and have never been yoked to a cart before. And then these cows found their way to the field of Joshua. And there the Levites took the ark of the Lord down from the cart along with the guilt offerings uh, that the Philistines had sent with it. And that day the Lord struck down some 70 men from uh, Beth Shemesh. And, and they, this reason was that they looked inside of the ark of the Lord. 70 of them died. Uh, that day, some men from Kiriath Jearim came and took up the ark of the Lord and they took it into the house of Abinadab. And that's where it stayed. And his house was on a hill. And they consecrated Eleazar, his son, to guard the ark of the Lord. And that's where the arks of the Lord stayed until we get to this moment in 2 Samuel chapter 6. Our passage starts by saying that David, again, brought together out of Israel chosen men, 30,000 in all. These were some of his finest soldiers. And it's looking like it's going to be a joyous day. A joyous day. And they're getting ready to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David. Verse 2 said... He and all his men set out from Baala of Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim that are on the ark. Here, here's a picture of an artist's interpretation of the ark of the Lord, or also called the ark of the covenant. In Exodus 25, we find the instructions uh, for making the ark. The ark was three feet nine inches long, two feet three inches wide, and two feet three inches high. It was made of acacia wood and overlaid with pure gold inside and out. And there were to be two cherubim, those are the angels on the top there, and uh, they were to be part of an ornate cover on either end of the ark, and they, and they were to be looking toward the cover with their wings spread upward. There were four rings of gold that were attached to the side of the ark where poles made of acacia wood would be inserted for transporting the ark. And inside the ark were the tablets of the law of Moses brought down from Mount Sinai, a jar of manna, and Aaron's rod, which had budded, if you remember that, and that showed confirmation of his leadership. The Ark of the Covenant represented God's immediate 
presence and the glory of God in Israel. And as I said, it had set basically out of sight, out of mind, sort of, uh, for the last 20 years in the house of Abinadab. And David wanted people to see the importance of having the presence and the glory of God in Israel. This was the plan and the reason for moving the ark into the city of David, into Jerusalem. He wanted God at the center of the lives of of the Israelites. And so David has this great, great plan to move it. It's a joyous day. Look at the beginning of the passage. What a joyous day. Fanfare. Basically, there's going to be a parade. And what could go wrong, right? Well, basically, anything that could go wrong did go wrong. They take the ark from the house of Abinadab, which we're told again is on the hill. And they put it onto a new cart. Wolza and Ohio were the sons of Abinadab. And they were uh, guiding the cart. And David and the whole house of the Israelites, we are told, are celebrating with all their might before the Lord. With songs, with harps, lyres, tambourines, sistrums, and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacum, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen had stumbled. And then God's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. And therefore God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. Needless to say, the spirit of joy and celebration were gone after this happened. Why did God allow this to happen? We might think that as we're we're reading through this. They were doing something good. Why why would God do this? David himself even, we'll see in a little bit here, thinks this. Why? What in the world? Well, the instructions for transporting the ark were very clear. The ark was designed to be carried Remember those four rings of gold and the poles made out of acacia wood? They were to be inserted and then Levites, who belonged to the tribe of Levi, were to carry the ark on their shoulders. Whose example was David following when they decided to transport the ark on a new cart? Who else did that? It was the Philistines. He was following the Philistines. But God had said, and you can find it in Numbers 4, 5, and and 4, 15, that the ark is to be transported with poles. The ark should not have been transported on a cart, new or old. Among other things, that it should not have been touched. It should never have been touched by a human hand. Look at Numbers 4, 15. It says, after Aaron and his sons had finished covering the holy furnishings and all the holy articles. And when the camp is ready to move, the Kohathites, okay, they were a clan within the Levites, uh, are to come to do their carry, the carrying. But they must not touch the holy things or they will die. Uzzah's intentions might have been good, good intentions, but God requires us to obey his instructions, obey his word, Even good intentions do not trump God's word. We can find ourselves in this situation too, can't we? No, not touching like the Ark of the Covenant, okay? But choosing to obey what God has commanded us to do or choosing to do our own thing. And that's why we need to follow God's word and not what we feel is right to do. And you say, oh, it it just happened in an instant. He he just wanted to make sure it didn't fall off of the cart. His intentions were good. That didn't matter. God had given clear instructions that it should not be touched. Or the person that touches it would die. And God always follows through on his promises and his commands. Wilson made the mistake in thinking that it didn't matter who carried the ark 
or how it was carried. Maybe, maybe he had become so comfortable being around it because it was in his father's house all those years that, that he thought he'd be okay in helping it stay on the cart. And finally, he made the mistake of thinking that God couldn't take care of the ark all on his own. It all goes back to choosing to obey God or choosing to do our own thing. You know, there are a lot of people that want to live the way they want to live this day and age. They don't want to accept what God has said is wrong. They'll say, ah, the Bible, that, that's antiquated. And I'd say it's so very relevant for today. Or they'll say, that doesn't apply to me. And I'll say, who do you think you are that you're held in such a a class better than the rest of us? The word of God God, as found in Romans 23, 22 to 23 says, this is righteousness from God. This righteousness from God comes from through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see that? There is no distinction. It says all have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God. It also says that this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Simple truth. Zuza did what God told him not to do. Even the Levites were not permitted to place their hands on the Ark of the Covenant. And so God fulfilled his promise that he gave in Numbers 4.15. They must not touch the holy things or they will die. And yes, it may seem harsh that Uzzah died for touching the Ark. But you need to look at this in light of God's holiness. And his absolute holiness meant that certain sacred tasks need to be done in a sacred way. And this leads me to telling you about the difference between us and God. He is holy, absolutely holy, and we are not. And that's why Jesus had to die. He was and he is the holy lamb of God. And his sacrifice on the cross was necessary so that through faith in him, all who believe will be forgiven of their sins and they will be able to stand in the holy presence of God and see him face to face one day. Now David, he's, he's mad. The Bible says David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. Here, here David is, is mad because what he planned, having the ark in the central city and in, reintroducing it as part of the people's lives again, his plan had failed. He knew the idea wasn't wrong, but he couldn't understand why the wrath of God broke out against Uzzah that day. He was very disappointed and he feared the Lord. David called the place Perez Uzzah. And and Perez means outbreak against. And so the place was called outbreak against Uzzah. David feared the Lord that day. It's a good thing to fear the Lord. So he feared the Lord that day and he thought to himself, how can the ark of the Lord ever be with me? How? And he sort of gives up on his plans, uh, taking it with him to the city of David. And so what did they do with it? Well, they took it to a man's house nearby named Obed-Edom the Gittite. And that's where it stayed for three months. And guess what happened? The Lord blessed Obed-Edom and his entire household. He blessed them. Yes, the Lord blessed His household. And I guarantee you that if you allow the Lord to come into your life, he will bless your household as well. And I know a lot of us automatically think of financial blessings when we hear about being blessed. 
And yeah, that may be a way that the Lord will bless you, but there are so many other ways that he can bless you. He, he will bless you with the basic things that you need. He will give you peace. He will strengthen you, give you good health. He blesses you with every spiritual blessing. And he will guard your hearts and your minds. And there's so many more. Read it in the Bible. How many promises there are from us, from God. David decides to go back down to take up the ark of the Lord from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David. And again, with rejoicing. See, that wasn't the problem. It wasn't the problem at all, the way that they were going uh, and rejoicing before the ark. There must have been something, something that David found out through searching through the law of the Lord as to why God's wrath had broken out the first time that they did it. And so look what it says in verse 13. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Did you catch it in there? In that? What were they doing differently? This time they're not transporting it on a cart. They're carrying it. And it's Levites that are carrying the ark. And you say, how do you know that it's Levites, Pastor Mike? Well, first of all, none of them are dropping over dead in the passage here. But there's another passage that uh, we look at. It's in 1 Chronicles 15, 11 to 15. And there it says, Then David summoned Zadok and Abiathar the priests, and Uriel and Asiah, Joel, Shemaiah, Eliel and Aminadab, the Levites, he said to them, you are the heads, you are the heads of the Levitical families, you and your fellow Levites are to consecrate yourselves and bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to place to the place I have prepared for it. It was because of you, the Levites, did not bring it up the first time that the Lord our God broke out in anger against us. We did not inquire of him about how to do it in the prescribed way. Isn't, it, isn't this what we should do before setting out to do anything? Inquire of the Lord and how he would have us proceed? This should also be in what we consider the minuscule things of our lives, and also, yes, the big plans that we have. How often do we fall flat on our faces, and then after things have gone wrong, we decide to inquire of the Lord. If David had inquired of the Lord, the ark of the Lord would have been there three months earlier, but he didn't. How often do we delay what God would like to bless us with because we don't include him in our planning or, or because we don't seek his will? May we do it God's way, not our own way. There is rejoicing, okay? The problem wasn't in how they were celebrating before. The problem was not, the problem was not following God's instructions. That's what the problem was. And now they've taken six steps. And you're thinking, well, that's not very far. Yeah, it's not. They take six steps. And then on David's order, they sacrifice to the Lord a bull and a fattened calf. Now they're doing it the right way. David is described here as being dressed in a linen ephod. And this is a priestly garment, very simple dress. And Keel and uh, Delitz describe it as this. It was strictly a priestly costume, although in the law it is not prescribed as the dress to be worn by them when performing their official duties, but rather as the dress which denoted the priestly character of the wearer. And for this reason, it was worn by David. It's talking about David's character at the moment. Another reason that David wore this linen ephod is that he was showing a humble attitude by setting aside his kingly robes and putting on this more modest clothing, a linen ephod. Here's the thing, and I want you to hear this. There was only one king 
that was going to be going into the city of David, and that was God himself. David got that. Yes, God is the king of Israel. And David laying aside his royal robes showed that God is the true king of Israel. Amen? God is king. David danced with all his might before the Lord while he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sounds of trumpets. And he poured out his heart before the Lord in his dance. He was genuinely worshiping the Lord with all he had. The verse literally made, uh, made uh, said he danced with all his might before the Lord. Not because he thought he had to, okay? But because it came straight from his heart to the Lord. It was how he chose to express his worship before the Lord. May our worship pour from our hearts before the Lord. Not out of obligation, but out of a pure desire to worship the Lord for who he is and what he has done. This procession eventually made its way into the city. Trumpets playing, shouts out to the Lord. As the ark entered the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul. The identifier is who she is. Michael, daughter of Saul, David's first wife, watched from a window. And she saw the king leaping and dancing before the Lord. And what's the Bible tell us? She despised. Despised him in her heart. The ark was brought inside the tent, which David prepared for it and set in its place. Then what did David do? He, he offered sacrifices, burnt offerings, fellowship offerings before the Lord. And when he was done, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave them a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins. And these things identify prosperity. And oh, how prosperous they were to have the God of Israel right in their midst. He gave them to each person in the whole crowd of the Israelites that day, men and women. And then all the people went to their homes, including David. What a great day, right? I mean, you could just feel it as you're reading through this. What a great day it was. What joy was in everyone's house, or, or hearts. And, and they, they took that joy home with them that day. And I'm sure David went home. I, I, he was bubbling over with joy in his heart. I know he was. And as he gets home to bless his household, his wife, Michael, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. This is where we often get the wrong idea that David was naked when he danced before the Lord. The disrobing comment is made by his wife, and we already saw that David was not dressed immodestly, but he had laid aside his kingly dress, his kingly robes, to show his humbling of heart before the Lord. And, and there are a few scholars that will say that David was actually just dressed in a loincloth, but I really don't think we can take Mike, Michael's comments of disrobing to say that he was immodest in front of, of the people. Her comments were probably from that of one who had been raised in the palace, princess, all her life, and not in a very godly family, as we know uh, how Saul was in his life, in his relationship with God. One, she was one who couldn't understand why David would have humiliated himself in her eyes in front of the people by dancing the way that he did, and especially by wearing simple clothes the way that he did. On this day, he was just another Israelite who was worshiping the Lord. She, she just didn't get it because she didn't have a relationship with the Lord the way that David did. Another reason that she might have done this is that 
This may have been the final straw for her. David had married other women. I had other wives much younger than her. Possibly had something to do it. Uh, also, she was taken uh, from David uh, when he had to go on the run and flee for his, his life. And she was given as another, uh, to another man as his wife, Palti, son of Laish. As I said, when David was uh, fleeing from Saul. And she actually helped him flee, if you go back and read the story there. And then one of the conditions that David makes for being king of Judah was that his wife, Michael, be given back to him. So maybe it was the final straw for her. Maybe that's why she looked out and she despised him in her heart. Here's the thing. David wasn't going to let her comment get to him. Here he was, he was coming back from what a joyous occasion. His heart was bubbling over with joy in celebrating the Lord arriving there in the city of David. And so he says to her, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, Israel, I will celebrate before the Lord. He basically said, it wasn't for you that I did this, but it was for God. That's why I did it. I will celebrate before the Lord. David said he'd be even more undignified than he was this day and would be humiliated even in his own eyes but honored in the eyes of the slave girls that she spoke of. But as for Michael, what happened to her? She had no children to the day of her death. Terrible thing for a woman. Don't let anyone tell you that you can't celebrate before the Lord. Hear that. Don't let anyone tell you that you can't celebrate. Before the Lord. There are days where we're, we're, we're flying high uh, in the Lord. I mean, we just got done doing something for him and we're celebrating and, and it, it's a joyous occasion. And then there comes that comment from a person and it just rains on our parade. Be like David who said, mm -mm, I wasn't doing that for you. I was doing that for the Lord. I was doing it for the Lord. I will celebrate before the Lord. Worship the Lord from your heart. And as David did, with all your might. Not out of obligation, but from a sincere and joyous heart. When I ask you to prepare your hearts and minds for worship, there's a reason for it. Put away all the stuff that's outside that's going on in, in your house or in your job or whatever is distracting you. Because you have come before the Lord. And it is time to celebrate before him. And so when I ask you, let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. And Mike plays the prelude. Tune it out. Tune it out, whatever it is that has your attention and give all your focus on celebrating before the Lord. Work on your relationship with the Lord so that you can understand what Michael could not. Let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. God, we thank you for passages like this. We thank you for instructions from you. Lord, may we be inclined to look at your instructions to us and your commands. And may we follow them. Be it in the little things in life to the big plans that we have. May we look to you and your guidance. God, I thank you that in this passage and so many in the Old Testament, they point to your son, Jesus Christ, the holy lamb of God who needed to come into the world because we are sinners, every single one of us, and we can't do it on our own. Just as Uzzah died for touching the ark, 
we, because of our sin, are unworthy to stand in your presence. And so Jesus, your one and only son, had to die on the cross of Calvary so that we who believe in the Lord and place our faith in him might have righteousness, might be cleansed from our sins, forgiven. And Lord, because of the great love you have for us and the death of your son, we may have life and life eternal. God, I thank you for that. What a precious gift you have given to us, our salvation. In Jesus. God, I pray that you would be with us now. May our hearts be inclined to you. And may they worship you with sincerity. For you are love and you are our God. And we thank you and we praise you. We celebrate before you now, Lord. And it's in the holy name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let us stand, those who are able, as we sing to the Lord, how great thou art. Those who are able, please stand.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and give you his peace. Amen. The ushers will dismiss you by rose.